I thought I'd start with a little information on sort of how much ugliness actually does, uh, is a handicap in the workplace, which was a lot of what uh, this show was about. Um, beautiful people do earn more. Beautiful people uh, who are judged to be beautiful by strangers looking at their photographs, on average earn about 5% more than other people do. Uh, and at the other end of the uh, uh, spectrum, uh, people who are judged as ugly earn less than other people do. The effect is bigger for men than it is for women. Uh, ugliness for women costs you about 5% of your wages. For men, costs you about 10% of your wages. Now, uh, and moreover, for men, it kind of haunts you at every stage of the career. Uh, ugly men get uh, fewer job offers. They get lower starting salaries. They get worse raises. Uh, for women, it seems to be concentrated completely on the raises. Uh, ugly women get the same job offers as everyone else. They get the same uh, starting salaries, but they, they don't get good raises, which is part of why they, they, they pay a smaller penalty. Um, part of the reason for that is that the ugliest women apparently opt out of the job market altogether. Uh, especially ugly married women are uh, very rarely uh, enter the job market. Um, at the other end, uh, uh, or, or, or another, uh, uh, on the other hand, if you look at, um, instead of looking at beauty, if you look specifically at weight, uh, on, on ugliness, it's the men who pay the big penalties. On weight, it's the women who pay the big penalties. If you're a woman and you lose 65 pounds, that's as good as having another year of college or another three years of job experience in terms of the effect on wages. For white women, interestingly, black women pay no penalty at all that we can see in the data for, uh, for weight. Um, but, but white women pay a big penalty. Uh, the, uh, uh, the other thing where we know that uh, appearance makes a big difference is height. Uh, for both men and women, an extra inch of height is worth about an extra thousand dollars a year in wages on average compared to other people with the same skills as you. Uh, that works for, for both men and for women, even among female identical twins who often differ in height a lot more than you might expect. The taller one consistently earns more. Um, I'll, uh, you can ask yourself why all this is. You know, what, why are people getting these, these premiums for beauty? Why are they getting these penalties, penalties for ugliness? Part of it is certainly with beauty that there are certain jobs that are only open to beautiful people, like Ashley's job, uh, she, or former job, she was a fashion model. Um, uh, but that doesn't explain why beautiful auto mechanics earn more than ugly auto mechanics, and they do. Um, uh, Part of it is that the more attractive people get assigned to different tasks. If you go into Home Depot, for goodness sake, look at the people working in the back and look at the people working the checkout counters. Um, you can sort of see why they call it the checkout counter uh, in, in, in terms of who, who they, who they put there. And this is Home Depot. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, uh, but interestingly, at least for height, we know that the reason you get uh, the reason tall people earn more is not because of the way they look, and it's not because of the way people react to them. It's not because they're intimidating. It's not because they're impressive. And the way we know that is because if you look at people who were short in high school and then had late growth spurts and are, date and are tall now, they earn like short people, uh, which tells us that being tall is no advantage at all in the job market unless you were already tall at 16, which, which tells us in turn that the premium for height is not coming from the way you look now, it's coming from the way you learned to think about yourself when you were 16. Being tall at age seven or being tall at age 11 has no reward in terms of wages. Being tall at age 16 has a huge reward. Um, if you weren't tall at 16, it's too late now. Um, the, the, the elevator shoes or any kind of growth hormone or, or late spurt won't affect your wages. Uh, height also affects uh, elevation to leadership rules, roles. Corporate directors are overwhelmingly very tall. I used to be a corporate director and I could never see what was going on on the plant tours because I couldn't see over the heads of all the other people uh, on the board. Um, uh, 38 out of 43 presidents have been substantially taller than the, than the average American. Um, uh, the, the last president to be of only average height was, uh, was Jimmy Carter. Um, so those are some facts. I could also, um, we could also talk about how um, beauty pays off in the, in the dating market and the marriage market. 
Um, beauty pays off for both men and women about equally in the dating market. We know this from looking at the way people do on Match.com. Um, but in the marriage market, um, it's only women who uh, benefit from, from, uh, from being beautiful, benefit in terms of the quality of the match, in terms of the income and education of the match. Uh, for men, uh, it helps a lot in dating, but in terms of the quality of the person you actually marry, looks don't seem to have any effect at all. So those are some facts we know from economic research, um, but uh, Ashley has uh, uh, a, a lot more to say and uh, well, I have some a much more interesting personal story, too. Um, well, yeah, and, and we can do that, but just to, to follow up, Steve, so a few questions. Um, so when we talk about economic research, uh, we like to use words like your, your outcomes or the you know, predicted life outcomes, but these are, of course, just averages, right? I mean, oh, you course. yourself are the, the exception, the, the kind of, you know, you're, you're five foot eight, right? Yes. Okay, so Steve is five <laughs> foot eight. Um, and, uh, and you yourself are on, were on a, a corporate board of directors. So my question would be, how is it that people can overcome these, uh, what would be called, look, what increasingly is, is a word that's being used even in legal cases called uh, looksism? Uh, discrimination based on looks, the relegation to um, uh, an unattractive so-called or, or so deemed person into the back of the store where they might have uh, lower chances of advancing. So how is it that people can over, overcome this? Um, how, how do people become the exceptions and break out of these kinds of broad averages? Can high heels help you at the age of 16? <laughs> uh, I, I the best I can do in terms of answering that uh, is that at least for height, where, where we seem to see in the data that it's, as I said, height at 16 that matters, which in turn tells us that it's the way you learn to think of yourself that matters. Uh, I guess the moral from that is that if you want to change your outcomes, you got to change not the way people see you, but the way, uh, the way you think about yourself. Um, participation in activities, people who participated in sports in high school, <laughs> their wages on average are 12% higher. Um, people who participated in clubs other than sports, their wages on average are 6% higher. Um, uh, again, high school, changing what you did in high school, it's too late for many of us, but, but uh, uh, I would guess, I don't have data on this, but I would guess that other things you can do to make yourself feel better about yourself are gonna pay off. Right, it's actually uh, the kind of economist logic underlying RuPaul's uh, uh, famous quip, like you gotta love yourself mm -hmm. before you can like, go out into the world. Which is an irony in the play, I thought, that, uh, that our, our protagonist, Letta, uh, doesn't know that he's unattractive. That, that's, um, that's kind of you know, one of the absurd things that like, kicks off a very absurd play. Um, in sociological uh, terms, we actually have a theory for how it is that people form an image of themselves in relation to how other people see them. We call it the looking glass self. That it happens early on in childhood socialization. We react. Uh, to the kinds of social cues that our parents, our teachers, our peers give to us. Um, and studies have in fact found that infants that don't have the kind of um, uh, idealized infant features, which are large eyes, uh, a big forehead, small chin, kind of like a Russian supermodel, actually. This, this kind of like, a, or what was the line in the play? The, uh, the, the slaughtered doe, kind of, you know, the, the big eyes, small chin. Infants that don't have this kind of pattern to their facial features receive less attention um, from their parents. That they're, they're looked at less and played with less. And this can potentially have uh, long-standing effects um, into how one develops a conception of oneself. So the fact that this lead character, Letta, doesn't know that he's not good looking uh, is, is of course totally silly. That, that he would know very early on and it would be impacting him all throughout not only the dating and in high school, uh, but certainly into the job market as well. Or at least if he didn't know that he was ugly, he would at least have a sense that people were not responding well to him. Right, right. It, it wouldn't be at this moment that he notices that nobody looks him in both eyes. <laughs> um, on, this, on this issue of the, the sorting of people in the labor market, so the concept that's in vogue right now in sociology is called aesthetic labor. Um, uh, emotional labor is an older concept in sociology. It's something that the sociologist Arlie Hochschild noticed in studies of flight attendants. When flight attendants in the 1970s go to work at Delta, Delta tries to craft a particular kind of persona um, in their worker that will represent what Delta is about. So if someone's being a jerk, you can't smack him as you might want. If you're a flight attendant, you have to smile and craft this kind of ideal emotional self. Oh, yes, sir, no, sir. 
and be pleasant about it. But increasingly, sociologists are arguing that in a service-based economy, it's not just the personality, but it's the combination also of the aesthetic. So we call it aesthetic labor. We have to work on ourselves, on our image of ourselves, um, and on the projection of a kind of ideal personality that's going to move merchandise. You can see this um, in the legal case, actually, in Abercrombie and Fitch. If you go to Abercrombie and Fitch, it's no surprise that people in Abercrombie and Fitch, they look like the people in the catalogs. They're gorgeous. They even have uh, shirtless male models standing outside, and you can take I a picture with them. I just noticed that recently. I couldn't believe it. Right. Standing out there in the mall. With you the can get a photo with them, yeah. And you go into Abercrombie and Fitch, and everyone looks really good. I was actually scouted on the street to work at Abercrombie and Fitch. I, I got stopped. Um, and I was handed a, a company card, and I was invited to go and work there for four hours a week, um, and I would be paid minimum wage, but I would get a great company discount on the merchandise. So then I can go and be a, a walking billboard for Abercrombie and Fitch when I leave the, uh, the office. So I, I ended up turning it down. But I mentioned Abercrombie and Fitch because it's actually a, a case that was settled a few years ago uh, in a class action lawsuit of, employee, of employees who claimed that Abercrombie and Fitch had either not hired them or relegated them into the less visible and worse paid positions uh, based on their looks, that they didn't have the Abercrombie and Fitch look, which raises some really interesting questions about what kinds of looks are valuable. If employers are discriminating on the basis of looks, looks of, of course, they're tied up with things like class, they're tied up with race. The Abercrombie and Fitch look, for example, is very preppy. Uh, it's, it's kind of college bound and it tends to be very blonde haired and blue eyes. So now Abercrombie has since settled their suit and trying, they're now trying to expand their look to be more diverse, to include more people into the right kind of look. I wonder what an economist thinks about this, discriminating on the basis of looks, because I actually know a little bit of research that suggests that it's in companies' best interest, that the play is, is onto something, that better looking people do perform better for their companies, or companies perform better when they have better looking people on their boards. From an economic perspective, or wouldn't it be rational? I, I would think when they have better looking people out meeting the public, which is, comes back to, again, why Home Depot is, is selecting who's working the, the, the counters and mm -hmm. who they're putting in the back. Uh, it, it does, that leads into an interesting question, actually. I mean, would, would you prefer to have beautiful work coworkers or ugly coworkers? If, uh, uh, on the one hand, you got to look at them all day, uh, so you would like uh, to have beautiful coworkers. And I think that is part of, uh, my guess is that's part of why um, beautiful people get paid more, because the other people in the office want them around to, to, to uh, it's more pleasant to have them. On the other hand, um, uh, if, if, uh, if you're in an arms race to try and get promoted, uh, and if uh, and if ugliness is a little bit of a handicap, maybe you want your coworkers to have that handicap. So it's 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 not at all clear whether other people's beauty is on balance a uh, mm. a plus or a minus. Uh, when I mean, uh, uh, do say heterosexual married men do they gain or lose when when there are more beautiful women on the street? Well, they like looking at beautiful women, but on the other hand, they also like thinking that their wife is the most beautiful woman on the street. So. Uh, it cuts both ways. So um, Steve alluded to this, this story that I have um, from my, my former life working in fashion until today, being here and, and having written a book about, about fashion modeling. So um, it turns out, so I modeled when I was younger, I got into graduate school at NYU, and I got scouted. Uh, it used to happen a lot. It doesn't happen so much anymore. I think there's, a, there's an age <laughs> decline. But so I was scouted my first year in grad school to, by, by a person who said I should go model at this company. I talked to my professors about it. They thought it was a pretty cool idea. And then I, I went and, and worked as a model, uh, first in New York and then in London. I did this for about two and a half years. And I, I went in, um, and the agents knew what I was up to, but some of the clients didn't. But I would go to castings and take notes on, on what transpired in the castings. Um, or what transpired on jobs, what are the different kinds of uh, rates that models get paid. And the, the book that I wrote, Pricing Beauty, is about the economy of, uh, of a labor market which is entirely based on look, lookism, on, on how one looks. Um, and one of the findings in it that is kind of uh, this ironic finding is that, okay, so the field of fashion modeling is one of these jobs that is hagiographied by young girls in the mass media. It's like the penultimate you know, thing, or, or the ultimate thing that a, a woman can do, you know, like the, the pinnacle of women's, women's employment. And it turns out that unless you become a Giselle or a Kate Moss, 
uh, and you become a winner in what's called a winner-take-all market, uh, you are in this kind of uh, base of a pyramid structure that's not making very much money uh, after all. But um, in fact, I think most models, if they could take their aesthetic capital and translate it into a professional field and uh, capture this 5 or 10% um, uh, benefit to their pay, they could do far better than actually working in the modeling market itself. That a lot of fields in culture industries, acting, film, yeah, uh, acting, writing, uh, musicians as well, they actually don't make very much money. The, the mass media tends to cover the winners because they do great. Uh, so our perspective is that there are very lucrative earnings in these fields, but it, it turns out that we don't hear from everybody else. Um, and in, in the, at the agencies that I was studying, for example, the agency in New York, um, they had about 20% of their models that were in debt to the company. Uh, and were, uh, you know, some of them would climb out of debt because you, know, you can always turn the corner and hit one big job, uh, but uh, consistently it was about 20% of them weren't doing very well. The U.S. Department of Labor estimates the average earnings, the median wage for models annually to be about 27000 a year. Uh, and this is also is something that the Model Alliance, which is a, a union-like organization for models, thinks as well. So one reason that we could explain this, um, aside from the possibility of hitting it big, uh, I also interviewed models. And yes, this is very enticing, this idea that maybe they can land that Calvin Klein or Landcom campaign. But another reason for doing it is that being a model, you're actually in the position of, of being the celebrated beauty. Mm -hmm. that, it, that in itself is, is an incredibly valuable and, and rewarding thing to do. Um, and I think it keeps people wedded to these, uh, uh, what some people might say are, are losing, losing kinds of activities or losing kinds of games, like investing in their looks, spending lots of money on makeup, um, or pursuing a kind of far-flung dream to be a model. But this raises another question, right? Of uh, but on the it's other rational. Hand, yeah, I mean, if they're if they're get my, my my immediate response to that is if they're getting if, if they're getting this attention and if the attention is rewarding to them, then then good for them. Right, right. Although rewarding on various levels, models tend to I think work against their own economic interests. For instance, for a model who's a woman, their prime modeling years would be between the ages of about 13, 14, uh, up to 24, 23, maybe. Um, so these are prime schooling years, actually, where there would be much wiser, more calculative investments in, say, education. Uh, uh, well, uh, whether that investment is wiser or not depends on, on how suited you are for education, too. I mean, there are, there, are, there are a lot of people who don't really benefit from going to college. Right. Um, right. And I, 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 would, I would hesitate to second-guess people. You know, if, when, when I see people making choices like that, I, I tend to assume that they know even if it looks stupid to me, I tend to assume they know better than I do uh, uh, what they're doing. But of course, you actually worked with these people, so you may, you may have some insight into how stupid they were. No, I don't think they're stupid. I don't think they're stupid. Sociologists don't think that our subjects are stupid. I, um, <laughs> sometimes, but not in this case. So um, no, I, I, I think that um, having been in it myself, not just from the interviews of talking to people, it was actually incredibly seductive to be in this world. So I was in graduate school, I was getting a PhD from NYU. Um, you know, the, the end game of that is to get a, a professor job, which I, which I ended up doing, but um, about two years into the program, I was thinking, oh, I'll just quit this you know, grad school business and go be a top model. I could be a fashion model and go work in Paris um, and, and make uh, you know, nothing or, or stay in debt for a year. And actually, many of the shows, they, they pay models nothing. Um, especially newcomer models to the field, or they might pay models in trade, the immediate value of which would be nothing, although nice souvenirs, perhaps you could eBay this stuff. Um, so, so yeah, I was, I was thinking, absolutely, I will do this, and then I would have to kind of come back to reality and think, well, I, actually, that's, that's probably not a, such a great use of time or a smart investment. On the other hand, most of the people who are deciding to try and go be models in Paris probably are not well-suited for getting PhDs from NYU. <laughs> right, right. In fact, a lot, a lot of the labor pool um, is, is foreign. Um, scouting has risen sharply since the 1990s with the internet, digital technology, ease of travel. Scouts are going far afield into places that previously um, were closed off. So uh, I've been spending some time with these model scouts 
um, who work a lot in Russia and in Brazil. Um, because these are places, and in Eastern Europe, these are places where uh, there are pretty limited existing institutions for upward mobility. Um, so getting a job, um, getting a degree and getting a, um, a white collar job uh, in a place like Ukraine um, uh, may pay less and, and be less appealing even economically than trying to be a model in Paris. The thing about Brazil is really interesting. Um, so the scouts, uh, they're going all over looking for models, but you know, these primarily peripheral or poor areas. And in Brazil, they go especially to southern Brazil because there's a history of German immigration. And scouts are looking for blonde hair, blue eyes, uh, uh, people with uh, colonial German roots, so like the Giselle Bunchen, for instance. And then Giselle becomes, mobilizes this idea of here's a Brazilian beauty, and this is uh, you know, the, the pinnacle of Brazilian uh, archetype. But in fact, uh, Brazil is uh, majority mestizo, it's majority mixed or, or a brown country. Um, so yeah, the way that the, the scouts move is, so I was always thinking, why don't they just go to Germany, right? And uh, uh, lots of blonde hair, blue eyes Germans there, but this is the, the reason about existing institutions. Um, it's simply easier to get a 14-year-old girl to leave home um, in a place like southern Brazil than, than in um, Berlin, for instance. Did, if, if anyone here has some question or comment, we don't we don't want to monopolize this. Um, yeah. What were your thoughts professionally about the play tonight? I mean, was there, was there anything that you found particularly salient to your lines of inquiry? Uh, I I I thought it was terrific as a play. I I I, I it seemed. Uh, I think I wanted to enjoy it for what it was and not spoil it by trying to, to fit it in with, uh, with, with the latest econometrics. Um, I, I, you, want to you want to take that? <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, one, one thing jumps out that is a, a really interesting and important sociological point of, about beauty. So the, the fact that the, um, the actor who plays Leta uh, is the same actor and the same face throughout um, I actually love that, that he goes through this, this very um, uh, audio graphic, but not visually graphic, surgery and, and transformation, but the face is exactly the same. And that's a handsome guy, that actor, um, uh, before, and then, you know, of course, after, he doesn't change. So it kind of, you know, for me, it brings home this larger point about the, um, the, social, the subjectivity of beauty uh, and the ways in which our perceptions of beauty are very much socially constructed. It, it, raises this larger point of what is a beautiful face, after all. Um, and, and the play kind of plays with that because it's the same actor very deliberately. Um, and so, Steve, in your earlier comments, you opened up with this idea of the, the penalty for ugliness and the reward for beauty. But we still haven't talked, actually, about what is beauty. Like, what, like, what is this beautiful face? Um, or what is an ugly face? Where do those standards come from? Sociologically, uh, I, I would say that they're very much constructed. If you look across culturally, uh, even body size, um, so girls in order to become uh, marriageable girls in adolescence are force-fed in parts of sub-Saharan Africa in order to become very large and voluptuous and hence beautiful and desired. Um, the, the current vogue for thinness um, it is in contrast to previous areas. Of course, we can think of the um, the, the, the Renaissance, or Raphaelite body, this very voluptuous thing that, that we see um, in old art. So these ideas of beauty, um, they're not timeless. They're, they're not so inherently fixed. And yet, there is something, there is something essential about beauty, or do you think? Do, well, I, I was going to, uh, you may know, I don't. Um, uh, I mean, for the various uh, studies that I uh, talked about before with the rewards to beauty and the the penalties for ugliness you have to first before you can do a study like that you got to decide who's beautiful and who's ugly and the way they do that is by showing pictures to panels of people and having them rate them um, I'm curious whether you know of any work uh, I don't although I, I feel vaguely like I remember having heard of this where they've shown the same pictures to people from different cultures and and whether when you do that the same people get rated beautiful or, or not? Do, are, you, uh, are you up on that? Not exactly the, this kind of study, but I've, I've looked at some of this um, in the aggregate. 
some some cross-cultural findings uh, hold true, or, or some elements of beauty hold true across uh, across cultures. So uh, those include in a face symmetry um, that's almost universally valued, having symmetrical features. Um, uh, you've um, uh, uh, had a professor who I don't think he was joking said that you know. Don't you think there's a reason that uh, that we don't see older people in pornography? I mean, aside from you know, if, 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 since the '90s, like MILF or whatever. <laughs> Sorry, just that there. But um, <laughs> but it's, it's a thing. Um, but but not much older than that, correct? I think. Um, so yeah. I'm not entirely an expert. So. Uh, symmetry, <laughs> symmetry um, uh, youth, um, healthy skin, uh, healthy teeth. Um, a waist to hip ratio uh, seems to be cross culturally valued. So it's not so much the the size of the body, um, because large bodies or thin bodies can be valued, you know, in different moments in different cultures. Uh, but having a, a waist to hip ratio, so um, a smaller waist uh, to a larger hip. And this this might be showing up in in the data I cited before on the on the penalties for weight, in that. Um White women, when they're heavy, take a big wage hit, really big, and black women take no wage hit at all. Now, I don't know, I, I can't explain that, but I don't know whether that has something to do with, with cultural views of, of uh, God knows what. Um, right, right, right. No, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what's going on there, but I'm also not exactly sure what's going on with a lot of beauty more generally. I mean, when I, when I see something that I think is a beautiful face, um, I don't know exactly what it's tapping into or what it's plugging into that makes me value it. I know, I know the consequences. When we see things that we recognize as beautiful, we attribute it with you know, this play, for instance, competence or a halo effect is what we would call it, that when beautiful people do things, uh, it gets read as, as a better quality to a point, I would think. Um, but exactly what it is that, that those faces or even, uh, I don't know. I, I, I do know this, which uh, is, is tangential to the whole discussion and has nothing to do with either of our fields, but I was, I was talking, I, I, I learned this from, uh, from, from the biologists uh, that I sometimes hang out with at lunch. Uh, <laughs> there is a study where they show people photos of women, and for some reason they've only done this with photos of women. You could do it equally well with men, but for some reason they've only done it with women. And they ask them to rate the woman in two categories. First of all, attractiveness, and second of all, personality, although you've only actually seen the photo. Uh, <laughs> but to, to, uh, they ask you to, to uh, rate them on what you think their personality would be like. Uh, and it turns out that both men and women rate women higher when the pheromones of monkeys are being sent through the air conditioning system. Um, and, uh, in both categories. Um, so uh, they extract these pheromones from monkeys and they put them in the air conditioning and the ratings go up in both categories, both, both male and female raters. Um, go figure that. <laughs> right, so, so it's not just looking at faces, it's also something else. So you, I mean, you, you, asked, you asked earlier what, uh, uh, or Raphael asked earlier what, uh, what we can do to overcome the handicaps of, of, our, of our looks. Maybe it has something to do with monkey pheromones. Yeah. So how does that gel with your theory that um, human beings are rational actors in the economy? If you can just change their behavior so much by putting monkey pheromones in Oh, uh, you know, uh, it, it's perfectly rational to like different things under different circumstances. It's perfectly rational to, to enjoy the chocolate cake when, I'm, when I haven't eaten all day and to not enjoy it so much when I've just uh, had dinner. And, and it's sort of, I, I mean, being exposed to pheromones is, is sort of like uh, having had a meal. It, it, changes, uh, it changes what you're looking for. Uh, and, and the fact that people are looking for different things at different times is not something an economist would consider irrational. We, 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 we use the word rational to mean that people pursue reasonable strategies for achieving the thing they want to achieve at this particular time. We don't, uh, we don't say that some goals are more rational than others. We say that people have goals, their goals change, and, and we call them rational if they seem to be pursuing reasonable strategies that lead to those goals. So I, I, don't, think, I don't think this is going to undermine economics. I have a question. Earlier, at the very beginning, 
are there similar studies done for personality? I so don't know of them. kind them. or a, a bitchy person is going, you know, weighing, you know, going to earn more or less. I mean, how it, is it? It's, I, I, my first reaction is that that would be hard to do because yeah. how do you know in the study who's kind and who's bitchy? But exactly. I, I don't know of anybody who has... It's a fascinating question. I don't know of anybody who's tried to do that. Maybe I, do. I know in, in psychology, personality research is a, a huge subfield. So, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm sure. Um, so it's not to say that looks are all. And uh, <laughs> regardless of, of, you know, how big or, or great your personality is, that, uh, that you will, in fact, be... Do, uh, do you know of anything that specifically ties personality traits to wages? Personality traits to wages, no. But, I mean, I... I, I would how, guess. how could nobody have looked at that? I, 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 I'm sure someone's looked at it. Somebody must have. But I, haven't have, looked but at I, it. I, 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 not only have I not, but I have never heard of anybody who has. And now that you bring it up, I'm sort of stunned. <laughs> it, it's interesting in the play that as he gets more beautiful, he becomes pretty. Yes. Beautiful. Yes. Like a direct corollary. Uh -huh. Right. Right. Of course. So an, another concept. And that, that's another interesting question that you could pursue: is you know, do looks correlate with personality traits? Well, so there are these psychologists at uh, Yale um, that are doing these uh, profile, or, yeah, it's shapes of faces. Certain shapes of faces are rated as having certain types of personalities. Um, so again, the kind of large eyes, small chin thing would, would give off a, a look of like innocence, uh, for instance. Um, but but I, would, I would just think automatically that the two are so entwined together because how you look shapes your development and socialization and how people react to you. This shapes your personality. Um, I, I would I would actually find it hard to untease them. That doesn't necessarily seem to go together to me, though. Really? Every beautiful person I've met has not always been the kindest or nicest. <laughs> <laughs> ah, right, and this is exactly the thing with the character in the play, that as he gets yeah. more kind of aesthetic capital, his personality takes a slide because he's perhaps so, able to... Yeah. Yeah, but I, I, I don't know any numbers on this, and there ought to be, and somebody should have done it, and I haven't heard of it. Yeah? The protagonist in the play, uh, at the beginning, he doesn't know that he's ugly. Um, do you, are there studies that talk about whether or not people correctly perceive whether they're beautiful or ugly? Oh, what a fascinating question. I hope Ashley knows the answer. I don't know the answer, um, but... I would think some, if not some graduate student somewhere, some professor somewhere is toiling away on these questions. Um, what do you think would be the answer? I, I found it a sort of uh, contrary to fact um, premise for the play because um, we get feedback all the time about our, our looks. Sure. That's sort of the basis of a lot of these studies. And I would think that uh, he would know whether or not he's beautiful or ugly because of the way people are uh, constantly reacting. Yes, yes, but people are probably more likely to inflate their looks, I would suspect. Uh, I mean, I, I do know of studies where, which show, not too surprisingly, that, that people consistently overrate their own abilities at various tasks. Mm -hmm. um, so consistent with that, I would expect them to overrate their looks, but I don't know of any research that directly establishes that. It's a, another really great question that I hope someone has looked at. Yes. Uh, so back to the monkey pheromone question. <laughs> I've told you everything I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a little, um, I'm wondering if you all know any statistics. We sort of talked about um, how people's visual perceptions affect all of these um, rates of success in various aspects of their lives. Um, and I'm wondering if you know any statistics about scent, about just like personal body odor perhaps, or um, I actually used to know some numbers on this, and I've completely, I don't have them at my fingertips, but I, I, this is something I used to know about, but it's five years since I thought about it, and my, my, my mind yeah, is wiped clean. <laughs> Wait till you're my age. <laughs>